to another episode of Media Munchers. I'm Athian. And I'm Adrian. And uh, today we're going to pick up where we left off on our review of Boba Fett. Um, yeah. I guess we're just going to get right into it with episode two. So, um, like last week's episode, it was split between two timelines, and it's obviously become a, a common theme between uh, two and three. And, mm-hmm. and it becomes important by the end of three, and we'll find out why when we get into that review. But um, long story short, uh, Boba's continuing to train, if you would, after he saved the, the life of a young um, Tuscan, Tuscan Raider. Exactly. Yeah. So now he's becoming kind of one with the tribe, so to speak. Um, so that's what's going on in the past, right? And uh, he's getting better at everything he does. He's learning to use their, their, uh, their, their, their I don't know how old it is, but it's pretty sure it's an ancient weapon. I don't know yeah. the exact name of it. So, yeah. But it's really nice. It's like stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's really balanced, too. From what I can tell, it's got a sharp end. It's got like this clobbering club at the other end that they carve. Yeah. Um, what's really neat is that uh, we learn as they go on in episode two and three, um, but primarily in two, that um, once they trusted him enough to uh, like give him that like, little lizard or whatever it was, they implanted yeah. it with him, which was really weird. <laughs> that was um, But it was cool. <laughs> it took him on like this weird psychological trip, and then he ended up at that tree where you could like get your own staff to make your own. That was really, right, that yeah. was tight. I enjoyed that little section. Uh, but was, he also beat up like a, a biker gang that I suppose... They, were they the ones inside guarding the train that were shooting at him in the first episode? Or yeah, the beginning of this so. one? Yeah. yeah, so anyway, he steals their uh, their little, um, I forget what they're called, little sand riders, or whatever they are. Yeah, they're, they're bikes. They're bikes, exactly. Yeah, what who cares? <laughs> it rides on sand, it's dope. Anyway, he steals that and he brings it to them to train. That whole sequence is cool, too. Like, I thought it was really yeah, it neat. Was, like, I, I the thought the, the action was better handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, Comparative to the first episode. Yeah, like, for, for some reason, it feels like they kind of stepped up their game a lot more in the second one. Because mm-hmm. uh, in the first one, it just felt kind of like, here, we need an intro. Like, here's your origin. Yeah. Like, they're just kind of like, whatever. Who cares? I, I think it helped uh, because he had the staff. And, mm-hmm. you know, him being an older older uh, gentleman, mm-hmm. uh, the you choreography yeah. can just be sped up a lot. A lot yeah. Easier. Yeah, that's true. That's true. If you're swinging it around and, and yeah, yeah yeah and he does it really well he's always making these intense faces i remember when they did <laughs> yeah. that uh the tribal dance at the end and, like it was just he was right, going right. for it he was like oh and it made sense he was the only one who could show anything everyone else was just in the mask so yeah. i get it i get it <laughs> but it was tight i liked all of that in present day um they're off to see uh after the assassination attempt they're off to see the mayor of mos espa again um because right, they right. Uh, all the signs point to him being behind the assassination attempt um, so it's very ominous, you know, they just barge through, they get through, and, uh, they, you know, ba- he's, Boba's basically calling him out and stuff, and Mara's like, oh, did you ever think that it could be someone else? And Boba's like, I'm not a fool. It has to be you. After the meeting with the mayor, uh, Boba Fett and his gang, they go outside and they meet the two huts, the twins, I guess, if you would. They're the cousins Jabba. of Jabba the Hutt, exactly. Yeah. And uh, they've come for Jabba's things, right? Namely, his crime empire. So I'm like, oh, shit, it's about to be a showdown, like, they're gonna get into a fight, whatever. Uh, but of course, Boba Fett's not gonna budge. Like he's earned this, whatever. So he says, you know, you should probably have to kill me if you want this stuff, right? Like, um, and then so they decide that you know they're gonna play things like not so extreme at first. Like they think they're gonna go surgical with it. And that's when we see that Wookiee, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, Boba Fett's not. He's not flinching or whatever. And so uh, apparently, a um, he's a previously established Star Wars character from the comic books called Black Kristan. Kristan. I'm not saying yeah, exactly. Like that. Yeah. So I thought that was cool that they tied him into that. Um, but the huts leave and Boba won't back down and uh, you know it's safe to say they'll come back right so uh, we go back to that other flashback and uh, we, we like it's back to his training and all that we already talked about all that um, but as the, as this goes on um, wait, where am I so here yeah this is what I thought was interesting so when we come back to that flashback it turns out that that train that shot him up was one of the Pike Syndicate's um, trains right the transport vessels from the mining or whatever yeah so they're the intergalac- this is the intergalactic crime ring that smuggles smuggles spice and i was like what is with all this doing stuff like is this the direct thing that star wars took from doing or like yeah i didn't bother to look it up first so yeah, yeah. so yeah. it feels weird george lucas took those kind of it, it feels weird having seen this after dune because <laughs> like it feels like such an afterthought whereas like dune was all predicated on this thing entirely like this right, is the yeah. main story that they're telling and everything else happens to be afterthoughts yeah and then in star wars it's like a small little it's just like a little thing like, bro, it's like, a little small side yeah. mission it's so weird because i'm like the parallels are really strong anyway so um i'm planning I'm, this, so this dune stuff's going on uh, <laughs> on uh, planets like tatooine and kessel right and the little fish fight the, these little pikes right the fish like faces they had a hand in the attack on mandalore and they were involved with the powerful crime organization Crimson Dawn. Um, so Boba Fett lets the survivors, he lets the survivors live, right, on the condition they go back 
to the masters of the message and that the Tuscans were going to be the ones to guard this and like get paid for it, right? To protect yeah. these things. Um, so this earns them more trust in the Tuscan tribe and that's what allows them to go on that spiritual spiritual uh, quest and all that with the hallucinogenic lizard. So all that happens, blah, 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 blah. And they're dancing around the fire at the end. It's, it's a good episode, right? Um, it's a lot better than the first one. So I was like, yeah, I, had, I had hope. It was really long. This is a really long episode. Mm-hmm. But I had hope. So episode three rolls around and the syndicate's looming. And it really seemed like those those um, those hut twins were going to be like the, the show's main villains. But they leave to Tatooine after learning most Espa's uh, sleazy mayor promised Jabba's territory to the Pike Syndicate. So that's where the tea really starts spilling. So they uh, come to Boba Fett's place. And they offer him the, the is it called the Rangor? That's what it's called. Right, right. yeah, the giant, the giant like monster. beast thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, delivered by none other, none other than Danny Trejo. I was like, nice. <laughs> I was like, that's like, I'm glad he got this little role. Um, and so uh, that's what's going on there in the present. Uh, and so what, what else? Where are we? In the flashbacks, um, Boba tries to extract protection money out of the Pike Syndicate's Tatooine leader in this episode's flashback. But they're already paying off the the Kitan Striders, like that the little biker gang that um, he paid off, uh, that Boba beat up rather in the bar. Yeah. And they're unwilling to pony up to two groups, right? Which seems fair enough. So he promises to take care of the Striders. However, when he gets back, he finds out that the Tuscan friends he he made like the whole camp's destroyed, like obliterated, right? And uh, presumably by the speeder goons, right? And it, it mm-hmm. even tells you with the little um, they even flash back to it. It, it is right, the, right, yeah. They, they, they spray the paint it exactly. And so. Um, we we might see him taking vengeance the next flashback, or it might be just the very end of it. I'm not sure how long they're gonna keep the flashbacks up, but I think it's gonna be here a while. Um, so and it's also likely the Pikes and the Kids hands like the group probably want smaller tattooing groups, and uh, they want them like you know fighting each other so they can like pay less money and still have their spice. But in present day, I thought it was interesting that someone came and told uh, Boba their piece, and he let him speak. Um, about yeah. like how he didn't like how business was being conducted and you're supposed to be protecting us, blah, 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 crime lord. Mm-hmm. And so he decides to do something about it and he's all eavesdropping too. And those like little, like that young group of like the modern gang. Yeah, the civilians in the perimeter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How they're all cyberpunked out. And um, <laughs> it was cool, the little like colored, coded uh, like bikes. I was like, what is this? this is so yeah, it was, was kind of... It was a little too too much. A, a little bit. Yeah. A little, they still got it, a little bit. It felt kind of out of place for a place like Tatooine. That's what I was thinking. I was yeah. like, this seems a little bright and vibrant and like just too punky. Like they, they look more rich than the people around them. That's what I'm saying. Like they look yeah. too good. Like they really stand out. <laughs> yeah. It seemed a little weird, but whatever. I think they just wanted to make no, uh, more toys to sell that were just different Probably. and cool. <laughs> anyway, so he offers them a job basically and that, that guy was not happy about it. And... Um, and long story short, he, like I guess they're under his employ, and uh, I kind of like how he's handling stuff. And I'm like, kind of also like, what's the end game here? Like, I understand that he's like just trying to be like, he's trying to like what is it rule with uh, what was it like respect instead of yeah, fear? respect instead of fear. So I guess he's 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 accomplishing that, and it's it's kind of coming together by the end of this episode. Um, we swing back to him like and Danny Trejo like talking about um what it is to raise the Rangor or, or and like. You know how they're kind of calm beasts until like they're provoked or whatever, right, and they right. bond with the first person they see, and so they do that whole process, and that's cool. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And uh, yeah. uh, it was nice seeing a different side of that beast. Um, and then he's, Boba says he wants to ride it. He's reading this ten times its size, and I was like, you think they're gonna do that, like an end fight scene or something? Like they train this thing up? I mean, how many episodes yeah, do we have? I think like they six? Must be. Uh, six, six, six more, I think. Yeah. Six more? So like nine more that came out too. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. Wow. Eight. So eight. So eight. Well, we already had it three episodes. Oh, okay. so, so if it's eight total, total then we have five more including yeah. this still though I thought we were only going to get it six so that, that's nice yeah um anyway so then we have the uh, Wookiee attack right and that's when that Kristan Black Kristan that's his name Chrysanthemum Chrysanthemum yeah. excuse me yeah. Black Chrysanthemum uh, <laughs> he just straight up rips that guy out of the Bactin or ba- what's it called Bactin chamber Bacta Bacta Bacta, Bacta chamber yeah, yeah that little healing too. chamber rips him out starts throwing him around this dude's in his underwear I'm like damn Boba can't catch a break <laughs> and I was like how did he get snuck up on? That thing's like a beast. Like I'm, I'm sure it could yeah. be stealthy, but like you saw yeah, everyone where, where were those him. Hops? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. I like how his. Yeah, they're, they're supposed to be his security. It, the, yeah, they're <laughs> supposed to be like next to him as he sleeps. I feel like. Yeah, it's like, something. Like the people, the, the little door. punk bike riders he hired <laughs> came before the hogs. And the hogs were useless. They got like lit up with a knife and like bitten into him. I was like, these guys suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's cool. Everything's getting you know thrashed. The little, his little allies from the gang, whatever, save him. Uh, for the most part and then eventually they get him over that little pit and they drop him in the Rangor pit right, right. Uh, with no no beast inside of it uh, at that point 
Um, but anyway, uh, I think that it was so interesting how, like, after he captured him, he, and then, like, the Huts came and gave him the Rangor and all that, um, that he, like, let the, he let the, the Wookiee go. Oh, really? How did you feel about that? I don't I feel know. Like it's I, I feel like it, it was kind of underserved, like, the whole situation. Yeah. Um, I feel like they kind of rushed uh, the, the events that would have happened. That's fair. Like, that, it, it makes sense, but they could have been drawn out a little drawn bit. Out more. I think so. I think right. so. Because like, they built it up for, like, this big whole thing, right? And, like, we're revenge. Ooh. And then they got that little fight. Mm-hmm. And then that was it. Like, I honestly thought he was going to give him a job. Yeah. Like, yeah, I thought he was going to employ him or something. But I, I guess... But I, I did like that little point of, like, um, he understands the code. He's like, you know, from one bounty hunter to another, like, you know, don't work for scum or whatever. Yeah. Or whatever he said. <laughs> so, like, I like that little bit. But I was like, man, it seems kind of wasted. But maybe he will come back and, like, fight in the final fight if he's... Like, I, I assume he will. Because yeah. they, they made a big deal of him. They really only got... Like one couple, fight, yeah. and Boba didn't really do much. He really didn't. I mean, what could he so, do? So if they, yeah, underwear, if they want to make, like, actually oppose him, then yeah, he, he needs redemption. Yeah, he needs a little <laughs> bit. But um, overall, it, it, it took, the show took me from episode one being like, ah, uh, like, it felt like a chore getting back into it. And like, I hate, uh-huh. I hate to say that about Star Wars, because like, yeah. it's loved by so many, right? So yeah. I was like, ugh, like, here we go. Like, let me get my brain back on. And um, it's like some people have been waiting so many years for this. It's crazy, mm-hmm. like, as to what to happen. Um, but now it's becoming more palatable, and now like, I'm so invested at this point, I might as well see like see it through, right? So I'll see how it ends for sure. I, I, we'll see if anything's worth speaking on. We'll come back for certain episodes if they're really good. Yeah, I really hope it picks up after this. I think so, man. Yeah, we need to be full speed. Like we get it, we get it by the end that the the, the Pike Syndicate or whatever is like now here and present, as like that biker told him. Right, right. And he's like, you know, there's a whole lot of them. So and he's like, they're preparing for war, and Bob was like, okay, we're gonna prepare too. Like it is what it is. I'm like war with two, like. They're here to get what exactly? What is the pike after in present day? Uh, it's not spice. I thought it might be. Maybe. Maybe. But here's the thing. He's not it's running. territory, I guess. I guess, right? Yeah. Like, what are they after here on this place? I don't know. Anyway, we'll find out. We'll find out <laughs> next episode, probably. But anyway, we're going to take a small break, and we'll be back with Peacemaker, episode one, two, and three. All right. All right, and we're back with our review. Let's start off with Peacemaker, episode one. Um, so the series premiered, uh, like the series premiere, rather, the series premiere episode titled A Whole New World opens with uh, Christopher Smith, a.k.a. Peacemaker, played by John Cena, getting discharged from the hospital after recovering from his injuries. Uh, he returns to his trailer home and is greeted by a team of agents who work under Amanda Waller, a.k.a. Royal, Viola De- Davis. And Peacemaker is recruited for another mission, of course, known as Project Butterfly, uh, headed by Clemson Mern. He's hired to be a contract killer and tasked with killing a U.S. senator. Uh, before beginning the mission, Peacemaker goes to his father's house to retrieve his pet bald eagle, Eagly. After attaining, I love that name. Yeah. After uh, a difficult interaction with his father, Peacemaker obtains a new helmet and suit. He meets up with Mern and the other agents at a diner and hilariously offends everyone. Later, Peacemaker tries to hit on Agent Amelia Harcourt at a bar, but is rebuffed. He then hooks up with a woman from the bar. However, the woman aggressively attacks Peacemaker and he is forced to kill her using his helmet's destructive power. Episode one, Big Apple, dude. Okay, first of all, from the jump, yeah, the shit is just funny. Like the tone is set perfectly. A lot better, in my opinion. I think what helps. For my personal taste, is that we're focusing on one person who happens to be part of an ensemble, as opposed to like the Suicide Squad, where like no one was the lead, and I had no one to really attach to, to like give a damn about specifically. Yeah. I think that's what it was. It's not that James Gunn is like a horrible storyteller or anything like that. It's just that for me personally, I need at least one person to kind of latch on to, and then I can kind of attach on to everyone else like as an auxiliary. I need like a leader, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I need yeah. the hierarchy. I don't know, it's just what I've been trained to. So anyway, <laughs> that might be it, that might not be it. But, okay. dude, it's funny, man. Like, the whole, the, the, inter- the interplay between um, Chris and the doctor and, like, about the x-ray and his Tinder profile. And then, of course, right. like, the janitor. <laughs> dude, the janitor was fucking hilarious. Yeah, that was like, I'm not trustworthy. Movie. We yeah. shared a doobie once, man. You shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> I, I went to MIT. He was like, and I'm working here. He's like, why are you working here? He's like, exactly. I'm like, yeah. Dude, I just love it. I love all the questions they raise and they don't answer. It's great. The, uh, that's another thing I'll say about this entire series, dude. The dialogue is fucking great, dude. Like, I, I wonder how much of it is, like, literally scripted. I'm sure a lot of it is. But, like, and then how much they let them run off and riff a little. Yeah, yeah. I definitely feel like there's a bit of both. I think so. But whatever it is, the line is so blurry that it all seems perfect. Like, it's mm-hmm. really good. Um, of course, he heads over uh, to his... Dude, his little escape scene from the hospital, also great. Great stuff. <laughs> and he's like, he really thinks he's out of the game. And yeah, like, the moment he, he gets in the car, he takes a deep breath. <laughs> he's all freaking out. <laughs> yeah. And I love how he has to pay the taxi driver in his helmet. Like his yeah. little dome. His yeah, it's dome. funny that's, that's how he, he loses it. 
That's so yeah. that's so stupid. I love it. <laughs> Um, and then so he's in his little trailer, which is really just weird and over the top. It's like painted with like stars and stripes and like it's just it's really over the top. Yeah, very corny. Very. Yeah. And he's in a trailer home. That's perfect. And then he has his whole place, right? And he thinks he's at peace. But then no, everyone shows up and uh, and then he's assigned to that task. And it's like, okay, we get it. We get it. Eat your vegetables. Suicide squad thing. He's still got the chip in his neck or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you for sure got to work for us still. But it beats 30 more years or whatever he had in prison. Um, so before the mission begins, he goes off to his father's house, and you could tell, like, oh, okay, this is another one of those, like, dads who are really old school and, like, you know, hard ass, and just, you can't please them no matter what. I get yeah. it. Um, there's a lot of great moments, especially, like, when the eagle hugs him and his dad's not there to take the photo. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's both, like, funny, but also, like, a little sad. Too. Like, yeah, yeah, because this show really does a good job of showing you, like, the loneliness that lives within Chris. Yeah, And that's, yeah, like, it's, great. it's kind of endearing. Even, though even, he's, even like, before that, when he, when he first uh, walks in, into the kitchen. Mm. And he tells his dad, like, I've been shot. The building's falling on me. Yeah, yeah. Like, and his dad just, like, basically just, calls him a pussy or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just does not give a shit. Yeah. And the same thing about his phone bill, too. He's like, I told you to cancel it. He's like, what, so it's my fault you went to prison? I was yeah. like, jeez, dude. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I agree. There's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of good character moments with him. Even through, like, the funny stuff and the sad stuff. Right. Um, what's ridiculous is after he... Uh, Meets up with Mern and the other agents at a freaking, what was it, a Chili's or an Applebee's or something ridiculous like that? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah he shows up in full costume and garb and helmet, and he's just kind of like, just you could tell he's just kind of from that generation or whatever. He just doesn't care. He's like like womanizing or whatever. And like everyone's like, dude, like chill. Yeah. It's, there's, there's so much comedy in there. And um, anyway, he, uh, he they're, they're leaving or whatever. And uh, like, I think, what's her face? I forget the, the girl's name, but the, the new recruit, uh, Waller's daughter. Right, right. She, oh, the one's in Waller's pants. Uh, yeah, I forget. But yeah. anyway, her daughter meets uh, Eagly, and like she, he nips at her, and she's like, oh, what the hell? I thought you said he liked everyone. He was like, uh, uh, Adebayo. Adebayo, gotcha. Yeah. That's her actual character name? Yeah, her okay. last name. Uh, Le yeah. Leota Adebayo. Leota. I'm going to call her Leota. That's yeah. a nice first name. Um, but anyway, so like that's the end of episode one, and like, dude, the, the opening ridiculous, over the top. I love it. That musical number that yes. he makes everyone <laughs> making John Cena dance in a full costume is hilarious, dude. It looks yeah. ridiculous. Um, yeah, they're, they're moving like toy, toy, uh, like, like little like, action figures. Or yes, something. they're ridiculous. Yeah. I love it. I love that. Um, in the second episode titled "Best Friends Never," Hardcore John Economos and, and Leota help Peacemaker escape from the crime scene. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention at the end of the first scene. That lady he ends up taking home after the awesome like bar fight scene where like the Asian hardcore just can't get enough from everyone, every man trying to hit on her. Yeah. Um, which was really well written too. Like it, yeah, didn't it, seem, is. it didn't seem like, oh, like preachy. I was like, oh, I, I get it. I see what she's saying. Yeah. Anyway, so after that, uh, and he strikes out with her and he goes home with some random like 80s looking chick. It turns out she reads his dossier or whatever about the murder of like the US senator and the whole butterfly project or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she ends up going to town on him. At the was it the end of the first episode? That was yeah, crazy. the end of the first. That was a really good fight scene. Um, <laughs> he's just getting this dude's just getting stabbed. I love he's dancing and he's just getting stabbed after that. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, that was a great little fight scene or whatever. And uh, so the, everyone's there to help him pick up the pieces and escape from that crime scene. Uh, before fleeing, Peacemaker finds a strange device in the woman's apartment. He holds a husband wife pair hostage, which is hilarious, and then jumps from their balcony. Yeah. Peacemaker escapes and Economos changes Peacemaker's finger. Okay, so that's the nerdy guy. It changes the Peacemaker's fingerprints and uh, the car license plate to the um, to the show name of his father, August Smith. Leota bribes a couple to take Smith's name during the police interrogation. The police subsequently apprehend Smith. Peacemaker becomes depressed by his inability to bond, form a bond with anyone. He's cheered up after a visit after a visit from Vigilante, an amateur hero who idolizes Peacemaker. So a lot's going on in this episode too, yeah. um, for better. And the whole the first twenty minutes, or whatever they spent escaping, is just really good. Like I mean. Everything fits. I love how he's a dumbass and he sticks his head out the window and like yeah. now the cops are onto him and everyone has to figure out how to like uh, basically get him out of this mess. Right, so yeah, everything. All, all the exits are covered. Yeah, it's like Nine a front and like a side exit and they're all covered. Yeah. yeah. So he used to jump off all the freaking balconies <laughs> yeah. after taking those two hostage and like flirting with that wife. And the dude is like, "Are you really flirting <laughs> yeah, in front dude. of me?" Dude, that was crazy. the laughs kept rolling, dude. There is yeah. like, every moment, and it's it's so funny. The balance is is just just right. And um, everyone has their little moment in the sun. Uh, hardcore it's like shooting up cops like tranquilizing them um uh leota has to drive away in the getaway car she's like that's cool too and she's getting shot at she has a great time um but she's understanding what the job brings and i love how like eagle's just around just circling waiting to come and he's like yeah. calls him in he's like i'm waiting and 
Um, another tight thing, I think, I don't know if we talked about this before. No, we, we did it outside the podcast. But at the end of episode one, he kills that that girl using the, uh, the metahuman, if you would, using that his helmet's like sonic right, ability yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah, it so, was like a sonic boom. Or something. something like that. It eviscerated yeah. her. And I was going to ask, like, do you think there's going to be a lot more other abilities depending on what helmet he's wearing? Because like, I noticed there was a lot in that little Yeah, yeah, his, his, dad, his, dad is, his dad had mentioned that he had, he had made a few of them back, back, back in the day. day. And they all have their own uh, like abilities. abilities. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, I hope, uh, and that the whole scene was cool too. How they opened it up from, like a little from the door and it ends up being like this little bat cave, this like a dimensional portal thing. Is that what that was? Like it wasn't like literally that. in his house, it was, right? It was like uh, morphing different. Like it wasn't. It wasn't like a physical space like we we usually. That's so weird. Yeah, I didn't get a good yeah. look at it like that. But that makes sense because it looked like a huge warehouse or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens pretty quick. But mm-hmm. but yeah, like it, it all forms like in the background. You kind of see it. That's so weird. Yeah. But another thing that's also interesting is that we have small hints to, uh, as to, because I have no idea, and I still didn't look it up, the past of his father. That I guess mm-hmm. he used to be a cape, as they called him. Yeah, yeah. I guess he made all that because he used to be some sort of version of, I guess, Peacemaker or maybe a different hero. Like I know, like, getting ahead of ourselves, they uh, in the third episode, I think, uh, he's, he's white called dragon. the White Dragon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like and there's a whole there's a whole race thing at play there. We'll yeah. get into that later. <laughs> but but I was like, okay, so he's been in the game a while, a long time. So that makes sense how his son kind of got like s- you know scooped into it. Um, but going back to like the the episode, I mean, they escape. Everyone escapes, right? And you know, morning comes. Everyone's like scattering. He's like, okay, how could you leave witnesses? Everyone's freaking out. A, a lot of great interplay between everyone. Basically, uh, John Cena's character uh, Chris is just still lost. No idea what like the audience what a butterfly is. Everyone's still continuing on business as usual. And everyone yeah. has their jobs to do. Um, I love all the interplay between the uh, the cops. The I forget their names, <laughs> right. but the cops and his dad, right, right. and like all the race things that are there, like boiling underneath that. It's funny, and then they get to nail him later because all the evidence points to him, mm-hmm. which is also hilarious. But let's go to the third episode. Um, before we uh, actually, okay, one last thing on the second episode. How did you like uh, uh, Vigilante visiting him when he was crying and all that jerking off? Oh, that was great. Dude, yeah. That was great. <laughs> yeah, Vigilante, I love his energy. I love his spunk. I love how he's still kind of like, even though he's intense and hardcore, he still has like that like idealistic views, as we'll find out in the third episode. Yeah. He's like, no, like I just kill bad people and like I feel good about doing it or something like that. It's basically what he alludes right, to. Right. He's like, am I crazy? <laughs> and then no one answers that. It's like, yeah, you're crazy, dude. Um, but anyway, in episode three, the third episode, titled Better... Better Goff dead. It follows Peacemaker and the rest of the team heading out to assassinate Senator uh, Goff. Mern reveals that Goff is a butterfly and suspects his family to be the same. However, when he refuses to reveal what a butterfly is and hides the other details of Project Butterfly, Peacemaker refuses to kill children, but insists that he will have to if they are confirmed to be a threat. During the stakeout, Peacemaker and Hardcore are interrupted by sneaking vigilante. Goff and his family are revealed to be butterflies and depict inhuman behavior. Peacemaker gets an open shot of the family, but freezes before pulling the trigger due to anxiety. Vigilante steps in and kills everyone but Goff. Goff's, but, uh, um, Goff's bodyguard, Judo Master, intervenes and fights Vigilante and Peacemaker. The duo is captured and Mern, forms a, uh, and Mern formulates a plan to rescue them. That is the, ne- the episode in a nutshell. Again, the comedy is firing on all cylinders. There's a whole bit where um, they're, in the, they're in the truck doing like a little briefing. And Leota's like swiping through her iPad and like some yeah. nudes pop up of her like her girlfriend or her partner or whatever. <laughs> right, right. And everyone's just like losing it and like shitting on her. It was a great time. Um, but it's interesting how Peacemaker, like even his whole model, he's like, I don't care how many men, women, and children I have to kill to achieve peace. And now he's kind of like getting cold feet about it. What do you think that was all about? Like if they were innocent, he doesn't want to kill them? Or like what, what was this whole anxiety stemmed from? Like, well, I think it's the idea of killing a kid. Just in general, but has but isn't that what he was preaching in like the Suicide Squad? Well, I don't know that he, he actually has. I mean, they haven't really set uh, set up much of his past to. That's fair, but I'm to saying tell us whether or not he's actually killed killed a kid or a mother before. But there's a disconnect now, between what he said and what he is. Is that why? So that's what you think the anxiety is stemming from? Is that he's been talking the talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, he's not necessarily comfortable in this moment. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's kind of like dealing with the morality of, of what it would be to kill a kid. Oh, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, okay, if that's what we're going off of, then it makes sense that he has like cold feet as to like, well, you know, if they are innocent, you know, I don't want to accidentally kill a child or whatever. Yeah. I get that. But it is interesting because he literally sees them like tongue out and human and everything, and he yeah. still has anxiety. So I'm not sure what that's about. But it is hilarious how Vigilante takes over and like just awesome like, 
like humming and singing. And doo, 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 doo. He's yeah, like, no was problem with it at all, which was interesting. But I loved it. Um, another thing too is that uh, that judo master, him fighting was hilarious. Dude, he was great. He was really good. How did you like that? That was awesome. Yeah, everything I think worked it was really you. funny, and it was a really interesting way that the way the way they choreographed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, him being like. What was it like two feet? It was like two or three feet. Because they they were explaining at the beginning that he was small. How he was like small and they've never dealt with uh, With that. Yeah. uh, Was uh, like a rival that that small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. And like, I I have have yet to look it up. If he's really that small, like, wow, that guy can move. Yeah. That guy can move. Anyway. That was awesome. That was great. No, all the fight stuff there, he was lighting up. I love how they explained the kia Mm -hmm. and how it's uh, it's supposed to explain, uh, or it's supposed to mean, uh, Transfer of energy. Uh, the the guy with the glasses. He's yeah, he was an uh, economist or whatever. Economist. Yeah. yeah, he he he's the one who said that. Yeah, and I was like, this guy knows a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how they they all have like little things like, that they know. About. Yeah, yeah. There's small little like encyclopedias yeah. in their head. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they explain that. Um, but yeah, so he basically he captures um vigilante and uh and um peacemaker, and they're inside like the little. Like in the third act of the episode, like Goff takes Vigilante and Peacemaker to the yeah, basement. It looks yeah. like a hive with some alien material or something going on. Mm-hmm. And so Goff tortures Vigilante to extort information out of Peacemaker, which is funny because he just doesn't give a shit. He's like, yeah, take, yeah. take his toes, whatever you want to do. He's like, no, no. All that's great. Um, Mern, Harcourt, and Leota arrive to re- rescue them, but they're withheld by a strange substance protecting the entrance to the basement. Mern uses an explosive device to blow off the substance after like a lot of attempts where it didn't work, and then it finally blows him back. Um, Peacemaker uh, is a result of the confusion and the explosion. He frees himself and he fights Goff, and he uses a shotgun to blow off Goff's head. Um, outside, Economo single-handedly deals with Judo Master and seemingly kills him as he was fleeing to tell the message to the others. Uh, in the end, Goff dies, and a butterfly slash moth-like creature emerges from his body. Um, the whole ter- the interrogation scene was hilarious. I love how his like torture equipment was too dull to cut to his toe, and he was, yeah. he was just screaming and stuff. I was like, this is rowdy. Um, but the butterfly reveal serves as a callback to Project Starfish, which dealt with quite literally a giant starfish. Um, at the moment, not much is known about the butterfly. It appears to be extraterrestrial. The um, butterfly is a parasitic being and can control humans residing within their bodies. After Goth's death, Economos' computer screen reveals that the number of suspected butterflies, the code word, the code word you know, obviously, um, right. it's rapidly increased across the globe. It seems like, I don't know, it could be like one in every two or three humans, it seems like, because it's like everywhere. It's really prevalent. Yeah. Um, so it's possible Goff served as a beacon for harvesting parasite in humans, or that his death triggered the awakening of butterflies, or that's just the way they presented the data, and they've always been that bad, and it's a recent thing. I don't right, know. Right, yeah. But what I do know is that with that many, unless they have this clean, like, oh, there's like a beacon, and it just rips all right, the butterflies yeah, out of everybody. Unless just... something like that happens, yeah. there's going to be like 20 freaking seasons of the show of them trying to go get everybody in the world. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So... It's interesting. Um, it, it's a really great episode. I'm, I've been so extraordinarily impressed. And I think that it helps to having... My expectations were, like, really super low for the show. Like, I didn't know what I was going to be. I didn't know what I was in for. I really, really enjoy everything that's going on here. I mean, what sticks out the most to you out of everything we've been discussing about the show? Just the... How much of James Gunn's style is just embedded in throughout the show. Every DNA fiber. It's yeah. there. It's there. And it yeah, works it's, it's, yeah, it's, really it's, well. And it's, the show's not afraid to do anything, it seems like, um, because we like, we skimmed over it, but um, after he gets arrested, uh, his dad, I forgot, I forgot his name, but uh, after um, Peacemaker's dad gets arrested, um, he goes to that prison, right, and he wants a seat in the sun, and he asks this like African-American prisoner to get up or whatever, mm-hmm. and then everyone's around him, and I thought at first maybe that these other prisoners had beef with the dad, and they were going to fight him, but then, then we learned, obviously, that he, they kind of serve him. In this weird, like neo-Nazi kind of like prison regime thing, and they call him the White Dragon. And of course, yeah. that um, that Asian cop was like, "Oh shit! Like, what's going on here? How come he can't be at Bell Reeve or, or one of the big supermaxes?" And they're like, "Ah, they're over full." I was like, "Same." <laughs> and I was like, "So what's gonna go on with that? Like, sure, he he runs prison, whatever. But like, is he gonna like what what part is he gonna play? Is he gonna have like a bigger role? Is he gonna be some sort of big bad or or peacemaker or anything? Gonna have to clash with him at some point? Like, what what's his story about? Like, you know what I mean?" I have no idea, but I'm really curious to find out what's going to go on with that. Another thing to consider, too, is that we keep hearing about the past of Clemson Mern and how, like, oh, he's done such horrible things and he's kind of atoning for that and he's not that person anymore. And in this, in episode three, he was like, 
oh, see, I'm opening up. I'm, I'm, I'm being better. Yeah, like, he's learning how to deal with his emotions better. And all that. It's like, okay, so, like, what's happened? You know, like, what, what, what exactly did he do in his time? It's all classified or whatever. Yeah. But, like, what could he have done that was so awful that he needs to reform now? You know well, what he mean? is supposed to be somewhat like uh, Amanda Waller, right? That's what I, they kept making parallels to him. Yeah. Like, exactly. They, they kept saying, like, you know, you're like Waller, or this and this and that. And he's like, I'm not like Waller. Like, she... She doesn't care about, you know, who she has to sacrifice or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, something along that, along yeah. those lines. So, um, it's interesting to see if he becomes, like, a big bad or nothing comes out of it or who exactly is the big bad. Because we have the, the task at hand, it's Project Butterfly, but where that exactly goes, I have no idea. But I am I'm ready for the ride, Big Apple. Like, <laughs> yeah, the show yeah. made me pleasantly surprised. And I was like, I'm with it. Let's do it. Yeah. High remarks. Um, anything else you have to add? No, I think that's it. Yeah. That's about it, man. It's good stuff, man. It's real good stuff. Yeah, really solid episodes. Really, and it, like it didn't yeah. feel like I'm like Boba Fett. It didn't feel like episode one was super weak. Nah, they hit the ground running. Like, yeah, good, good, good. And it, there was almost no, uh, no, like no filler. Yeah, yeah. Because anything that appeared like filler had a purpose. Mm-hmm. Every little conversation where there's a joke or whatever, it's still serving the story. Like every yeah. little small thing, what's a butterfly? This and this and that. They're getting sewed up, dyed beard. It all works. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah. So um, we'll take another small break, and then when we're back, we're gonna hit a, a quick review. Of nobody, because I don't have a lot to say, but I got a lot to say. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) All right, Big Apple. We're back uh, from our break, and we're just going to get into that nobody review. So uh, this was actually on our list of movies we had wished we'd seen. And we thought, you know, it could be easy. It could be easy to just easy watching and get into some action, whatever. Have some good stuff. Have some good times. And um, while there was action, and it was entertaining at times, the movie itself felt very, uh, how do I put this? Like, just empty? I don't know. It felt like it's just a really yeah. copycat of... I know the same people worked on it that they did John Wick, right? Yeah, I believe the director was the stunt coordinator for John Wick. Right. Or and at least half, half of the team. Exactly. And it showed. It did. There were some cool fight scenes here and yeah. there. There were some moments, cool moments in, in fight scenes and shootouts and stuff that were cool. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, did it not feel just kind of like a like a direct-to-TV like movie? Yeah, it felt John like uh, just an excuse to make Bob Odenkirk look... Look cool. good, and that in and, in that it, it kind just of it just uh, left it at that. Like there there wasn't much more to it beyond it. it. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it felt like a half baked idea. It really did, and it yeah. just happened to go all the way through. Like he had a family and whatnot, and it kind of it kind of serves as a what if a John Wick type character had a family and like yeah. left the life behind, and then was kind of sort of pulled back into it. Yeah. But in this one, he kind of just what was the reason again? He didn't even have a compelling a super compelling reason. It was just like they got robbed one night. It wasn't like someone shot their dog. Or uh, yeah, kind of. Well, also the the little bracelet. That yeah, his daughter the bracelet. Lost, which turned out it was just lost. It, it is in his room. Yeah. yeah. So like part of him really wanted to kind of go back to it, and they right. showed that they did a decent job of showing that in the beginning with the whole montage of just like yeah, monotonous same job every day. Mm-hmm. He didn't like it, bus pass kind of thing. So yeah. they did an okay job of showing that, but I don't know. Like everyone, I remember my brother and even my pops was just like, "What is like." What, what even, what was that? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, and it, you know what's ridiculous and over the top is, um, God, who plays him? He plays uh, the old man, his dad. Oh, um, yes. Um, freaking Doc. Is Christopher it? Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. Well, well, he was funny in the nursing home, and like, but he was just like shooting people and not getting hit once during that whole huge Yeah, shit he, didn't, he didn't get hurt at all. Like, at all. Like, he was just like, ah, shotgun. Yeah, just, he, like, he came out completely unscathed. Yeah, it was... I was like, dude, what? <laughs> Like, there's only so much belief I can suspend, my guy. So, like, I don't know, man. It was just kind of like a turn your brain off and enjoy some action movie. And don't get me wrong. There was some cool stuff. Like, one of my favorite shots. And there was some creative, like, booby traps and, like, kills and stuff, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just felt like like a whack-a-mole kind of situation. Like, you know, it's just kind of like, here, we're setting it up. And the bad guys aren't going to get maybe one hit in. Yeah. And Bob Odenkirk gets messed up a little bit, but that's it. And one of the coolest shots I was going to say a second ago was the one where, like, they throw the gun in the air. I think his brother's passing it to him. Right, and right. like Bob Odenkirk catches it, and like it's like the gun cam as it's flying through. That's like one of the coolest things that happened in that movie. And that's a shot. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. like everything else is pretty forgettable. Um, I guess it was cool that he had his basement rig to to blow up. But that's about it, or like right. to burn really hot. Yeah, I thought I thought they were creative with um, how resourceful he was. Very resourceful. Yeah, and I did like how he bought that place in gold and like transformed his old work outfit to like a final stand or something. Mm-hmm. That was neat. But other than that, I was like, okay, this I can see why this kind of flew under the radar a little bit. Like, yeah, it wasn't that remarkable. It didn't do for me what John Wick one did for me. And yeah. I was like, whoa. Yeah, was John like, Wick had like really 
full uh, setup with the mythology and they expanded upon it with that little blip in the sequels. Yeah. I feel like this one, it played on the gimmick that he's nobody. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of didn't need to uh, fill you in on, on his background beyond that. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I feel like if, if they were to do a sequel, they need to expand upon it. They have to. And he has to become somebody. Yeah. Because they, they alluded to it with like, everyone saw it. They were like, whoa, we saw his files and he burned a bunch of cars and people or whatever. And right. Like, cool. But like, I don't know. You're supposed to take it at face value, right? Like, he's mm -hmm. just a bad mofo and that's it. Yeah, he's supposed to be like some secret operative for the FBI. Something like that, right? Something. I don't even know who to work for, but someone, something, some sort of agency. Yeah. But I was just like, <laughs> at the end, I was just kind of left feeling like, okay, cool. Like, it was a ride, but it was like not much of one. <laughs> like, yeah. nah, I don't know. I, I wasn't too impressed with it, is what I'm saying. I think uh, I think the trailer also kind of worked against themselves because that was probably the best scene that they put in. Yeah. Uh, which was the bus scene. Yeah, it really I think was. that was probably the better action scene. It was one of the. Film. It was definitely a highlight. Certainly, yeah. I think it was, it was one of the best, if not the best. So, yeah, yeah. kind of a letdown, but at least we could say we saw it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you think they're actually gonna go through the sequel? I think they uh, set it up. I don't know, because it it's not like John Wick where. It had a it had a small like, uh, uh, the like it only had one trailer and then it came out that week. Oh, I see. So it, it, there wasn't a lot of build up and then it surprised everybody. That's true. Whereas with this one, it had, I think it, it had, had plenty of similar, marketing. Yeah, it had a little bit more uh, marketing put sure. into it, but the turnout wasn't that great. So mm -hmm. I don't know that this one can. I think what helped John make a lot too was like the word of mouth for sure. Yeah, like because. The word of mouth was almost non-existent on this thing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? At least in my circles. So, yeah. but yeah, I, yeah, that has a lot to do with it, I'm sure. But look, they made a little piece. They made a little film. I'm sure they're happy with it. It was just an excuse <laughs> to flex, like, fight choreo muscles and stuff like that. Yeah, which is, I think... If it was like, a showcase of that, it exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If it, it was, that was the point, then it succeeded yeah. in that, if nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, definitely not a, a cinema masterpiece, but enjoyable in some parts. So, that's my review. Oh, nobody. <laughs> um, but anyway, it is what it is. Thank you for joining us for another Media Munchers. Uh, for Media Munchers, I'm Matthew. And I'm Adrian. And we'll catch you next time. Yeah. All right. <laughs>